Okay, so now we're going to talk about half lives. Okay, now if we're measuring radioactivity from a sample of radioactive material, remember that when a nuclei decays, it turns into a more stable isotope, it becomes more stable. So it's only usually going to decay once and it's going to go from something that's unstable to something that is stable so once it's decayed that's it it's the end of the the game for that nuclei so over time the nuclei that are decaying giving out radiation there's going to be less of them left over so we're going to have a look at the effect that this has on our measurements so we can't see radioactivity doesn't smell, doesn't make any sound. So how do we detect it? Remember, photographic film is one way or to get readings and numbers. The Geiger counter, a Geiger-Muller tube connected to a counter or rate meter will tell us how much, uh, how many detections we're getting, how much, how many ionizations we're getting. And the interesting thing is they, to have a rate meter, so we're measuring how many per second so this can be used to measure the amount of radiation and the traditional ones would give would you have a, a measurement with a needle and a meter and you would have a uh, a click an audible click that you can hear as well and and that audible click gives you a really good feeling for how much uh you're detecting you hear lots of clicks like then you might want to start getting worried if you just hear click 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 every now and again then it's not so worrying so we use the clicks to, to be able to hear any like maybe f bursts of radiation that we're detecting that we might not actually see on the scale if we're if we're not looking at that time so the audible bit is is quite useful i'm going to set up an experiment with uh, different uh, isotopes and a Geiger Muller tube at school and the counter at school and when I do these recordings I'll be turning on the loudspeaker so you can hear the clicks and, and get a feeling for what it feels like when you start to hear lots of clicks that's when you need to start to worry a little bit maybe but why does radioactivity decrease over time now here we've got our counter Geiger Muller tube we have a source of radiation, an unstable isotope. So at first here, the rate meter is showing 4,000 when we start off. Where's my mask on? Okay. And then after a certain amount of time, it's, it's showing less radiation from this source. Now, why? Well, for example, if, you, if, I, if I had... Mm, 30 radioactive atoms in this sample and five of them had decayed giving out radiation that had been detected well then there's only 25 left behind to decay so there's less atoms left behind to be decaying now each isotope has a calculable probability of decaying in a certain amount of time okay and that probability is going to tell us how fast it's, it's, it's going to decay. Some have a very high probability that they're going to decay, and they'll do it quickly. Others have a very low probability that they're going to decay, and it'll take a lot more, a lot more time to do it. So, if we jump on, here's our sample, for example, of 30 atoms. If in that 10 second period here, five of those atoms are decayed, there's only going to be 25 left over to decay. And each of them having the same probability of decaying, that means I'm going to get less decays happening as time goes by. After another 10 seconds, stopwatch has moved on. Those 25 that were left, well, four of them have decayed, and there's only 21 left. After another 10 seconds, 
three of these that were left over decay now there's only 18 left and as the number of atoms remaining reduces so does the number of decays that I'll be getting every second so over a certain amount of time here it was 12 o'clock when it started now it's almost half past six this count rate has dropped from 4,000 down to 1,000 now we can calculate these probabilities so how are we going to do it half-life is the amount of time that it takes for half the atoms in a sample to decay remember radioactive decay is spontaneous and we cannot control it we don't we, we can't make it happen the only thing we can do is calculate how pro how probable the probability of it happening so each element has its own rate of decay and that's called or probability of decay and that's linked to the half-life the time it takes for half of the atoms to decay or for the the count rate from a sample to drop to a half of what it was when we started so for example id131 the half-life is eight days so if we start off at the 4000 counts per second after eight days we'll be getting 2000 counts per second Ooh. so if we plot this on a graph what we'll see is a smooth curve okay and drawing your smooth curves you need to practice you plot the points the proper measurements that we get and if you put your hand you turn a bit of paper so you've got your hand here then you can use your pencil to draw a smooth curve without having to move your hand so put your hand as if this was a circle in the middle of the circle is easier so we can record the activity and the amount of counts coming from a sample over time we can plot this on a graph so we're getting 80 counts per second here and over time after 10 minutes we're getting a lot less so we plot these points on the graph and we draw, draw a nice smooth curve through all those points so half-life is the amount of time it takes for the activity or the count rate to drop to a half so if we start off at 80 at zero time then at 40 that will be about after two minutes now doing this on a graph it's always best to do it two or three times and take an average so you're showing that you know you've got to take two places on the graph and you can show the examiner that you've drawn it. because if you take one place here where you cross it the axes the examiner can't see that you've taken that so best place I take were like 40 and 20 take 20 draw across there that's going to come down to about four if we did it at 10 then it would hit at about six and we do that a number of different times and we take the average because this is probabilities and the best way of working out probabilities is by repeating and repeating and taking an average to get closer to the real probability but we can see here we dropped from 40 to 20 40 was at 2 20 was at 4 so the half-life was two minutes and exactly the same thing happened here that doesn't that's not the way it goes in real life in real life you get slightly different half-lives and you take the average to average out and get closer to the real number so half-lives have vast range okay now you might have thought that the most the least exciting element is boron boron exciting no but boron 12 has a half-life of 0.02 seconds does not stick around for very long has a very high probability of decaying radium has a half-life of more than a thousand years that's a hell of a lot more boron if you're taking measurements and if you're doing uranium 235 710 million years that's not boron it's boring you won't have a boron you'll be dead before you've got to anywhere near your first half-life whoop so some types of new ground are more stable this uranium-235 is much more stable than the boron 
Xenon 133 is an isotope that's used for studying lungs in hospitals. It has a half-life of 5.2 days. Why does that make it suitable? Well, that's because if they give you a dose of Xenon 133, after five days, its level of activity will drop to a half. After another five days, it'll drop to half again, so it'll be at a quarter. After 15 days, it'll be half again, so it'll be at an eighth of its activity. After 20 days, it'll be at 16th of its activity. So in less than a month, its level of activity will have dropped to almost zero, very close to nothing. If you use an isotope that had a half-life of 100 years, the activity, you'd have died before its level of activity had dropped to a half. Now, carbon-14 is a fun one because we can do something interesting with this. So, what's the half-life of carbon-14? It's measured in thousands of years. I would do 200, for example, maybe 4,500, 100, so touch less than 10,000. So that half-life was about 5,000 years, 80, it's about 12,000, 40, it's about a bit more than 15, 15 16, 17, 17,500. So there, it's a bit more than 5,000 years. If we averaged a number of different readings out, we would see that we get about 5,700 years is the half-life. So if we start at 320 counts per mi minute, after 5,700 years, we'll be down to 1, 160 counts per minute. And a lot of you will be thinking, well, I'll be dead by then. 11,000 years, you'd definitely be dead. <laughs> so what's the use of this? Well, the use of carbon-14 is very good for dating dead things. So we can date archaeological objects because carbon-14 gets made from nitrogen in the upper atmosphere that gets hit by cosmic rays and it gets converted into carbon-14. Carbon-14 is unstable. It has a half-life of 5,700 years. So that carbon probably formed part of carbon dioxide. So that carbon-14 gets taken up by plants in the form of carbon dioxide. This guy, his bogman Pete, has eaten some of that carbon dioxide in the form of glucose that's been mm, trapped by the plants so that carbon 14 is in the carbon dioxide that has become part of his body the amount of carbon 14 in the atmosphere stays pretty much the same so the amount of carbon 14 in his food as he's alive stays pretty much the same oh, and he just fell in the bog and drowned and died oh dear what a pity so now that he's died, he's not taking in any more carbon when he eats. So that the level of the amount of carbon-14 inside his body over the next thousands of years is going to be dropping. So hey presto, what can we do? We can look at how much carbon-14 is left inside his body. If we dig up and find that body at the bottom of a peat bog, that's why it's called peat. Oh my god. Okay, forget that joke. So we take a sample of his body, and by looking at the amount of carbon-14 left inside his body, we can work out how long ago he died. For example, mm, boats, uh, boat wrecks, things like this, Roman wrecks and stuff have been dated using the carbon-14 that's left in the wood, because when that wood was chopped down and used to make a boat, it stopped taking in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere, it stopped taking in carbon-14. So half-life of carbon-14 is about 5,700 years. So up until about 10 half-lives, it's, it's measurable, okay? But once we get to about 10 half-lives, the amount of carbon-14 is too small to measure accurately anymore. So carbon-14 dating does not loses its accuracy. Now I've got an app to do carbon-14 dating. Yes, you know, I'm on... I'm confined to my house at the moment so what's the first thing I did I downloaded a dating app <sighs> well, I, nobody laughs because I'm recording this by myself so the dating app is for doing carbon 14 dating yeah 
that's about as interesting as, as my uh, love life gets nowadays is downloading a carbon 14 dating app you can forget about tinder so anyway uh, it's carbon 14 dating is good for about 6,000 years if we need to look at things that are older than that we can look at other isotopes so, such as uranium 235 that's really good for dating rocks that make up the tectonic plates and because the amount of uranium 235 in the earth's mantle is fairly constant and so when the magma cools down to make rock uh, then that uranium 235 starts to decay so we can date rocks that make up the tectonic plates using uranium 235 and because we're talking about millions and billions of years of time then that uranium 235 isotope is useful for for these kind of uh, time periods the only problem is that we have to make sure that these samples have not been contaminated with materials of a different age which might confuse things especially after all the nuclear weapons tests that happened in the 1940s uh, that very much contaminated all of uh, the living things on the planet and so made carbon-14 dating after 1940s a little bit useless uh, but there's lots of cases where it is extremely useful for like roman wrecks and stuff for example uh, a piece of bone from a living body has a count of uh, the bone the fossil has a count of 25 and if in living tissue the count is about 20 then 20 200 sorry 200 down to 100 is one half-life 100 down to 50 is two half-lives 50 down to 25 is three half-lives so we're talking about three times 5,700 years so about 16 a bit more than 16,000 years hey presto 17,100 years old so the quiz what I'm going to do is I'll put you the quiz on Google quizzes to do so if you want to complete that now and we're going to look at experiment with radioactive dice where I have lots and lots hundreds of little red dice uh, that have one side colored in red when I throw it on the table if the red side is face up that means that that dice has decayed so I remove it from the sample and you can see how a sample of a few hundred dice representing radioactive nuclei how they decay as I throw them one time after another okay so I've got a video of that it only took me it took me about an hour to do uh, but I speeded time up so that it that you can see the whole video the whole experiment in about five minutes so remember, to answer questions, half-life is the time taken for the number of radioactive atoms in the sample to decrease by half, or the activity of that sample to decrease by half. Okay, and that time is constant for different isotopes. So enjoy the quiz, and enjoy the experiment, and what we'll be doing with the diet experiment is uh, doing a method, writing a method, drawing a graph, and working out the half-life of those radioactive dice just for fun <laughs>